see a lot of people I know in the audience, which is cool since I have so many institutes I'm affiliated with. I got Fast Connections right there. Sarah came to support me. I got RTI, who we worked with over the summer on developing the app. Uh, so many great people here. So thank you all for coming, and I hope not to disappoint you. <laughs> Uh, just wanted to give a big shout out and thank you to all of our funders, BASS, DGHI, Data Plus, Center for Global Reproductive Health. That's a picture of our team and we're very diverse. We're all women, but we are <laughs> diverse and there's a lot of different majors in there as well, which is hard to show in the graphic, but we have, as you heard, computer science, gender and feminist studies, global health, psychology, we have a public policy PhD candidate on our team. So we are drawing on all of our strengths to get this project off the ground. So why are we doing this? Why are we studying big data, or studying reproductive health and using big data? Uh, the first motivation is that one in three women in low-income countries who begin using modern methods of contraception uh, to avoid pregnancy quit within the first year. And about half quit within two years. So we are pretty astonished by this statistic, and we thought, you know, how are they measuring this? Um, and it turns out there's this great data set um, called the Demographic and Health Surveys. It has the contraceptive calendar in it, but it's a big mess, right? Like the data quality is high, but getting the statistics out of the data is difficult for someone without technical skills in R or Stata or programming and visualization. And we thought, what are the chances that someone who needs this data and wants to look at trends is gonna be able to pull it out themselves? We thought that was pretty close to zero. So we wanted to first create a visualization that's it's going to show people um, what this data uh, entails in terms of trends by different reasons for discontinuation, different methods, and then we wanted to move on to the next slide here. So our first aim is to create a web-based tool that anyone can access that's going to curate the raw data. We did that during Data Plus. The second aim is to de determine how big data analytic techniques, so that's kind of where the big data interface with reproductive health is for us, that the demographic and health surveys have these contraceptive calendars that are about um, uh, kind of 60 observations per woman in a survey of 14,000 people. That's big data, it's high frequency, uh, so high volume, um, high velocity, and uh, variable, which are kind of the three traits of big data. So we're going to try to apply some um, machine learning big data techniques to this data, which has never been done before to kind of understand the clusters in the data to help um, advocates uh, make better or help influence better policy. And then our last aim is to look at how internet and social media data can improve reproductive health surveillance. So one thing about the DHS is that it's collected every five years, but uh, imagine how many times women are Googling like, IUD and side effects or pill and side effects online, can we get some trends out of this? And then can we validate them with the gold standard DHS data? So that's aim three. Uh, the next slide, this is, Samia, how does this, how does this work? This is poll everywhere. Yeah, so we kind of just want to hear um, how you guys have used demographic and health survey in the past. So you can go to the website polyv.com slash globalhealth001 or text that in to that number. Um, and we'll, as you guys send in responses, we'll see uh, what everyone's experience is with DHS data. Yeah, so whatever your response is going to show up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so... Do you, you want, want us to do, do this now? now? Yeah, yeah, do it right now. Hey. Do it right now. <laughs> Poll the audience. What is your knowledge about DHS data? Do you use it in your work? So exciting. It's participatory. Wow. I see some people using it in their computers. People have their computers. Molly, are you answered? I'm also going to answer. No. Okay. Fast connections. I oh, bet that was Molly. <laughs> yes. Who said yes? Melissa uses it, right? Because it's the gold standard demographic health survey. It's the uh, population representative data, right? When you're drawing a sample, you want to compare it to the DHS to make sure your sample is representative. Um, I've used it, but the data is not always complete. Uh, all right, bias that class. So, who says the data is not complete? In the back, what what data were you trying to use? 
Oh, this is for a class um, okay. where we're given a data set and we're analyzing different things in the data set. Um, but we have to exclude a lot of people that are missing. So grant grant apps, yes. So of those who've used it, how easy was it to get the data out of there and get the stats you need? Are you making a face, Melissa? I can't tell. Yeah? It's okay. I mean, I, I would... You know, I usually go to the to the report, the DHS report for the country, and then oftentimes that would kind of lead to more questions, which I might go in and try to look at um, using the data, mm -hmm. requesting access to the data. <laughs> okay, never. All right. So thanks for sharing. Um, we had another question around, uh, has anyone heard of the calendar data, the contraceptive calendar data before today? <clears throat> that one you can just raise your hand probably. No, no one's heard of it? I'm not enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly wants to answer. <laughs> yes, no, no, okay. So that's one of the barriers we think to using this data, that it's difficult to access. Uh, people who should know about it, who care about reproductive health, don't know about it, right? So how can we have some yeses, have some noes? Um, so why should you know about it? Um, uh, oh, the DHS surveys have been collected in almost 80 countries around the world since the mid-1980s, and they're collected about every five years. So there are basically tons of surveys and trends over time. They're cross-sectional, but they're um, population representative. So it's the place to go for that kind of data for grant applications, like people said, and designing um, surveys. So the question then is how big is it? Um, if you look at about 91 countries, seven waves every five years, an average of 20,000 women in every wave, and then 60 months of data, so retrospectively reporting contraceptive use in the 60 months before the survey, that's about 764 million person months. So that sounds like big data to me. Does anyone disagree? Anyone wanna? No? Okay. So, we want to apply some of those techniques that have uh, been developed in other literatures to this data. And it is something that hasn't been done before, so there's a lot of feeling our way around and trying to figure out um, how to do it. And I like to think of it as um, uh, getting old data to do new tricks. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so I really like this topic for that reason. So I'm gonna talk about the descriptive piece and then I'm gonna go uh, let the students talk about the predictive piece. So what does the calendar look like? You may be asking yourself. Uh, survey data, so you're filling out, the enumerator is filling out the survey for every month and then the analyst, analyst gets the data in these kind of 60 to 80 character strings depending upon when the survey began and you have to turn it into an event file somehow, right? So you have to bridge the gap between how do we make sense of these 60 to 80 characters and turn it into something we can analyze into trends over time. So we have converted the data to event files. We're eventually gonna put our code up on uh, GitHub so that other people could access it as well. And then imagine this, Later, uh, we're going to turn it into a dynamic visualization. So uh, sit tight, it's happening soon. So what are the phases of our project? The first phase was Data Plus, so that was last summer. Um, between May 29th and August 2nd, we had a group of two students. Samia is here, and then Melanie Lawe, who's a graduate student, was on our team. Um, and then we also had uh, RTI providing technical assistance. So Alex Pavlov, who's the director of ICT at R RTI, um, heard about our project and thought, like, yes, that's I want to help with this. And he's a systems design engineer, basically. So he helped us put together our systems requirements. How do you build an app? How do you build a web? platform, what do you do, how do you make sure that people are actually going to use it, and then our Bass Connections team picked that up at the end of the summer and started um, doing stakeholder engagement around it, right? So going to conferences, getting the app into people's hands to figure out whether we're actually filling a gap for them. Um, are we, you know, are we needed? And I think the early answer is yes. And we're going to the International Conference on Family Planning in Rwanda next week, um, trying to get the website and app into the hands of 
more researchers to figure out whether we are filling that gap and what people, uh, what people think of it and what we can do to improve it. So for those of you uh, who haven't done kind of an app development like life cycle, we wanted to talk about that a little bit. So we didn't just start out developing this and just say, you know, like we have this great idea, let's, um, let's develop it and everyone's gonna use it, right? If you build it, they will come. But uh, we first created a very minimally viable product, so an MVP, and we took it to uh, FHI 360. So there are a couple of researchers there who are intensely involved in contraceptive calendar data and contraceptive research, and we had them in a room and we showed them our very early product and they all thought it was great. Right, they, the contraceptive calendar data, so I know you guys don't use it, is one of those data sets that, like if you've gone through it, you form a camaraderie with everyone else who's been able to go through it and analyze it, right? So if you bring up the contraceptive calendar to someone who studies family planning, they're like, oh man, I had to analyze that once, so oh, that was the worst. So that's the kind of thing we're kind of trying to address with our visualization and app, that you don't have to go through that whole process, but you can get those stats out. Um, so before we started Data Plus, we went out and found there was a need for it. Um, the first couple of weeks, we were identifying what are called the pain points. So what are these gaps that keep people from using the data? And one of the important things we had the students doing was developing these analytical memos, right? So just basically jotting down everything you did during the development process. So it's a living document so that anyone who picks it up next kind of knows what you did and can follow the process. And then when you write a paper about it, you remember what you did. Um, and then by week three, we were already developing our systems requirements, uh, a wireframe, which is basically a drawing of how you want the app to look. And then uh, we developed our user stories, uh, which are, uh, Sami is gonna talk about them a little more, like put yourself in the shoes of a particular user. If they wanted to use the app, what would they need to do? What does the app have to give them so they can do their work? Um, and then we, by the end, kind of middle of Data Plus, we had a really strong MVP and a dissemination plan. And then we started seeking user feedback from our peers and then, um, people uh, in the user categories we identified. And then we're iterating based on feedback, so we continue doing that. I'm gonna invite Sami up, who's gonna talk about more what we did during Data Plus. Hi everyone, I'm Sami. I was one of the two students working on um, Data Plus this summer. Um, so as Amy mentioned, uh, before at the beginning of the summer, what, the first thing that we did was look at what data visualization tools already exist um, in terms of reproductive health and kind of looking at the, the availability overall of uh, existing data visualization tools. Um, and we did this in order to figure out what really we wanted our specific tool to do. Um, so over the course of our search, um, we found uh, clear pain points emerge. Um, so gaps in existing visualization tools, um, particularly in the context of data visualization for reproductive health um, and family planning. So um, just to give you guys a, a look at kind of the analysis that we did in these existing tools. Um, so what we did is we broke down um, the tools that we found by specific categories in order to incorporate those features into our own uh, tool as we were building our wireframe and starting actual development on our apps. So the first category that you can see up there is um, interactivity. So we wanted to see uh, which of these uh, visualizations actually allow users to dynamically interact with data. And so you can see the, um, the tools that are above the line are kind of the ones that we thought were better than the ones that are below the line, but we basically ranked them based on after we completed this chart and kind of categorized the tools based on their features. But you can see that the tools that we really thought did a good job of visualizing data allowed <coughs> users um, to interactively, uh, to work dynamically with uh, inter interactive uh, data. Um, so the next category we looked at is what kind of visualization options these tools allowed. So um, the tools that we thought that, they were, that were better at visualizing data had various different um, visualization tools. So for example, allowing people to view data geographically in a map format, but also in trends over time as a line graph um, or as a bar chart um, or a scatter plot. Um, and then the next category we looked at, which was especially important since we are looking at reproductive health data, was looking at uh, what 
specifically in this field, these tools allow you to visualize. So um, one thing that you can kind of see by looking at this column here about contraceptive discontinuation rate is that out of all of the tools we looked at, only one really had any data available on contraceptive discontinuation. And you'll see in a little bit that the, the format of this tool displayed this data in was really not uh, friendly to a user and you couldn't really get much out of it. Um, and then some other categories that we looked at were contraceptive prevalence and unmet need and kind of those were more along the lines of what was already existing. So that's what we really want to hone in on discontinuation data in particular. Um, and then just to take you briefly through the next couple of categories, um, we thought it was really important um, in terms of geographical representation to allow users to look um, at data both cross-continentally and um, looking at uh, kind of allowing for comparison between countries um, within a continent and cross-continentally. Um, and that's what you can see in kind of the, the pros column. Okay, so then moving forward, um, this is the tool that allowed users to actually see contraceptive discontinuation, Track 20, um, and it was really it was it was great to see that they actually had some data on discontinuation, but the only kind of visualization feature was this table, um, which doesn't really allow people to see um, data broken down by specific indicators. Um, so what we really wanted to focus on is use, utilizing the DHS data and the fact that it allows for so much categorization by uh, socio-demographic factors um, and allow users to actually break down discontinuation rate, discontinuation reasons, and method use um, by very specific indicators or regions. So in developing our systems requirements then, we identified some key stakeholders that we wanted to target our tool towards. Um, so some of the stakeholders that we uh, considered when writing our systems requirements were advocates, um, researchers who perhaps might use this tool for grant applications, um, students, so undergraduate and graduate level students who might use this for um, thesis work, um, and then also um, people who are working at ministers, uh, ministries of health. So just to take you guys through one example of how we wrote this, um, this is an example for what we propose an advocate might come to this tool to use. So to gain insights into DHS contraceptive calendar data, um, and then also look at trends specifically by urban or rural areas, view specific provinces or countries, and then also a variety of socio-demographic factors. So um, age groups, income level, education brackets, um, factors like that. Um, so then once we, once we decided what the, what the uh, stakeholder would actually need to come to this tool to do, um, we wrote what our tool needed to do for the stakeholder. So as you can see, we wrote that, that our tool must allow users with low tech skills to actually um, manipulate our, uh, well, move through our app. Um, and then also allow the user this flexibility to compare multiple socio-demographic factors um, as well as geographic areas. And then we also wanted to have a tool that allowed users to actually download graphics once they chose all of the um, options for looking at whatever specific so, uh, set of data they wanted to look at. So that's a feature that we incorporated into our apps as well. So at the end of the summer, we developed four web applications in R and R Shiny, um, and as you can see, we have we ended up creating four different tools that um, portray data in very different ways. And the two that we're going to be focusing on today and demoing for um, you all is our trends over time tool. So that's this tool here, and our core diagram tool, which focuses specifically on discontinuation and switching behavior. So looking at um, switching between contraceptive methods and also the reasons that women particularly discontinue. So we're gonna transition to our line graphs app really quickly. So can you put up the next slide oh, just yes. to show how, how it works? Let's do this one second. Yeah, okay, so this is uh, this is what our Line Graphs app looks like, and we're going to demo it on, on Amy's computer. Um, but basically, all of the different features that are in the application, so first, the user selects um, the if they want to view contraceptive prevalence or discontinuation rate, um, and then view either monthly or yearly averages. Um, and then you can select various geographical breakdowns, so 
by country, um, by province, or by urban or rural breakdown. And then all of these are socio, uh, social indicators. And then here we have specifically information about uh, specific contraceptive methods. So if you want to view um, by, for example, the pill or IUD or injections, um, and then specific reasons for discontinuation as well, if you're looking at contraceptive discontinuation rate. Sorry, can I just ask where you have that slide up there? Do people have to type in exactly what they want, or is there a drop-down So there's a drop-down, but okay. you can also type in what you want. And yeah, we'll show you that. We're going to demo it right now. Do it live, as they say. So here's monthly contraceptive prevalence for Rwanda. And to your point, uh, when you click in the drop down menu, then you can see the list of potential countries. So you can add Kenya, you can add Guatemala, which are the only three countries we have at this point. Um, so then anytime you select a different subset, then on the back end in R, it's doing the subsetting of the data for you. So if you want to see, uh, women with no education in Rwanda versus women with higher education and look at the difference in contraceptive prevalence. Ignore this part because we actually have to subset the data a little bit. <coughs> Just ignore that part. Um, but you can see that uh, in Rwanda, those with no education, looks like they have um, higher contraceptive prevalence. So that doesn't seem right. Um, so good. Find all the errors while you're <laughs> kind of projected on the big picture. <laughs> Um, and then you can do by contraceptive method. So if you wanted to know what the prevalence of injections was, you could do that. Um, you could also look by yearly instead of monthly. Um, and then if you wanted to look at the contraceptive discontinuation rate, you could also look at the discontinuation rate for injections. You could add the pill, uh, condoms, right? So yearly trends in discontinuation of these different methods. And I'm pretty sure this one is going to work for discontinuation reasons. But let's just give it a whirl. So um, those who became pregnant while using uh, any method has decreased over time. And what I think is interesting is that for those who wanted to become pregnant, those who are stopping because they want to become pregnant is decreasing over time which goes along with kind of the decreasing fertility in um, across the world. Melissa. Amy, did you have to um, clean the data prior, so or we do had you, to, are you pulling directly from the data that's available on DHS? The raw data, is that what you mean? Yeah, if it's from the raw data from DHS, or you had to clean the data, because I'm sure there are all types of contradictions in there as well. I don't I was just wondering how you Yeah, so we took the that slide I showed earlier that has the uh, the strings of data, so 60 letters and then we're recoding them to the word that goes with the letter so pill is p or something like that. And then we're creating an event file and then we're just aggregating by these different categories. So in the back end, in R, we're starting with uh, a data set that looks like this, that is like the case ID, the month, um, whether it's long or short, the contraceptives they were using, age, and all that good stuff. And then we're filtering to get a data set that looks something like this. And then we're showing you the contraceptive prevalence and the contraceptive discontinuation rates. Um, mm -hmm. So this cleaning and uh, like subsetting, this happens inside Shiny or outside Shiny? So the subsetting happens in Shiny. The main event file is done before you get to Shiny. So we have stacked event files for all three countries in our data. And then in the Shiny script, it's basically uh, an if else statement where it's like, if they've chosen month, you're going to group by month. If they've chosen month and province, you're going to group by month and province. And then once you've created those uh, prevalence and discontinuation rates, then there's another group by another filtering that's showing you exactly the ones that you want. So it is happening inside that shiny three-part thing? Yeah, so it's happening inside the server part okay. of the shiny app. Yeah, and once you have a country, once you have this um, code written, is it plug and play for each additional country or is there a lot of individual data? 
So the DHS does a pretty good job of making the data sets comparable across countries. So you'll always have VO25 as urban rural, right? So we can just stack the data together in a big long file and then any new data set we add to the app should just, um, uh, just get added to the plots because they all have the same variable names. And we make sure they're in the same format before we uh, give them to the app. Any requests? Does anyone want to see? Like to do requests. So, how much of that kind of adjusting of the country data sets do you have to do? I guess you said they're they're pretty good about making sure making them consistent across countries. Um, so it varies by I think phase of the DHS. So they have a different recode manual for when they change questions, and then they're doing a lot of that on the back end, but it may not match directly across phases. And where it really creates an issue is when you ask someone where they've given birth and then a new, like in Indonesia, for example, they created this new institution called the Post Gazette in 2011. And so that category is not in previous data sets, right? So when you merge them together, sometimes your computer is like, That's, that one's NA because the label doesn't exist, right? So it's a lot of cleaning like that. Um, but for this contraceptive calendar data, I think, like some of the discontinuation reasons have changed over time. So it's a little work on our end to kind of unify them and make sure that works out. But that's something that the analyst would have to do, right? Anytime you would want to look at this kind of data, you'd have to pull it up and create the event file because you don't get, you know, this nice file. You get the file we showed you on that earlier slide. It's just like the string of letters. And we have another visualization. Oh, there's another question? Yes. Hi. So this is Amy Vargas-Tronsi. I'm here with my uh, coworker, Allison mitchell Few from RTI. And I'm really kind of curious, maybe more for Sonia, what were some of the, I guess, more pressing challenges that you encountered as you were trying to develop um, these visualizations, like the, the tools? Um, I think probably some of the biggest challenges were uh, incorporating all of the different features that we wanted to see in terms of what libraries were compatible in R. So some of the issues that we've had is, uh, for example, our line graph is mostly um, displayed in the Plotly library, but it's it's it was fairly uh, recently written, so there's still a lot of issues in terms of uh, like aesthetics and stuff like that, and um, also kind of like making it compatible with um, R, like. The, the feature that runs our time, um, and in some of our other applications as well, kind of making our um, change over time animation feature also compatible with Plotly. Um, yeah. Yeah, so for those of you who don't use R, it's, a, it's an open source platform, it's free to use, and their package is developed by people like you and me who are interested in doing stats in R. So Shiny has just been developed in the last four or five years, I think, and so even since I was using it before, like there's an event handler now. Like if you don't choose a country, this pop-up says, instead of crashing, <laughs> the app says, choose at least one country. So we think that's a great improvement. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so these uh, DHS data, I'm assuming that they are available in what format? So we're using the Stata files from the DHS, yeah. yeah. So we're using the Stata files and then uploading them into R. They're available online, I assume, they're in the public domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we actually have 2,200 data files <laughs> that we have, you know, the potential of putting into this from app. these three countries? What's that? From these three countries? No, from almost 80 countries around the world. So um, I think Malaysia collects a contraceptive calendar in every DHS. So if there are five surveys, we have uh, 25 years of contraceptive histories. Yeah, so in Kenya, we're only showing you, or in Rwanda, we're only showing you 2009 to 2015, but it goes back a lot farther than that. These are just the ones we've cleaned so far. Yeah, so we have all these trajectories and we want to be able to summarize them in some way. So that's where the machine learning piece comes in. Uh, Do you need an internet connection to operate this? So, <laughs> yes. This one, since it's running locally on my computer, you don't. Uh, but 
we're posting it to the web, and then eventually we want to put together an R package so that if you download the R package, you'll get all our code, and then you can run it locally. It's pretty zippy as it is. Pretty zippy, but uh, we don't have it. If it, when it's running on the server, it's a little bit slower. Yeah. Because then, you know, I'll show you how many uh, observations it's working off. It's working off uh, like 3.3 million observations, and that's just three countries. <laughs> so, big data. Does someone else have a question? Yes. I just wondered if you could talk about some of the trends or findings that you've been able to see um, thanks to the visualization or what your yeah. stakeholders have said. That reminds me, I wanted to show you something that we saw that was like, oh, that's quite interesting. So when you pull up Kenya and you look at the discontinuation rates, you see this spike, right? That's pretty consistent. And so it's spiking every December, <laughs> basically, right? <laughs> so we're trying to figure out, uh, and, the re and the spike is happening, I think I can show you, from country specific reasons. So it's not side effects and it's not cost and access. I think it's all these, well, you can't really see that, but it's the country specific reasons. So when I was in, I was in Kenya about six weeks ago and I asked someone like, what do you think of this? And like the country shuts down, like the health centers, this was their hypothesis, right? Like you can't get anything in the country because no one's working over the holidays. So in December, most people are discontinuing because they can't get the methods they usually use. So the next step in that is to see if there are births in right nine months later mm -hmm. to see if births are also spiking. So that's one thing that I don't think we would have known without visualizing it, right? Like, how would you know to look for that? And it's similar in Guatemala. Not as high, but yeah, that's Kenya still. But little spikes in Guatemala. Yes, so um, how do you handle variables like the wealth quintile that vary across countries? So we just use uh, the five quintiles. So it's the poorest within that country. And you're comparing the poorest in Rwanda to the poorest in Kenya. OK. They're, they're not necessarily at the same level of wealth, right? So the way the wealth quintile is uh, uh, constructed, right, is relative to everybody in the country. Yeah. So it's the poorest in Kenya relative to everyone else in Kenya. So we just take the wealth quintile and say, like, you're the poorest in Kenya, you're the poorest in Rwanda. And so they, the poorest in Kenya could be richer than the poorest in Rwanda, but we divide them by wealth quintile because there are relationships between wealth quintile that are similar, maybe within country. Um, okay, so we also have a chord diagram, which Samia is going to demo. So this is our um, core diagrams application that focuses mostly on specifically discontinuation and switching behavior. So um, what this allows you to do is choose a, a starting month and an ending month um, to look at uh, the users who, so this is specifically looking at um, only users who discontinued or switched a method um, from your the, the starting month and the end month that you chose. So over here, I've selected um, January 2009, um, and here I've selected January 2010, so exactly a year later. Um, so this shows you that from all of the women who were using a specific contracep uh, method of contraception in January 2009 over here, um, what their trajectories were and how they switched using a method or uh, discontinued a method um, in January 2009. So just to specifically show you guys injections, which is the highest, uh, the most commonly used uh, method in Kenya, um, if you can, you can see that um, 
out of all of the women who either switched or stopped using injections from January 2009 to 2010, we see that a lot of them are moving towards um, methods um, in the top, so in the top right, which is um, all of these methods um, from in January 2010. So the way that we've colored and ordered our methods are from most efficacious method to least efficacious method. So you can see that people who are switching from injections, out of those who are still um, using a method but it's, it's something different than injections, they're still kind of using those more efficacious methods. Um, so for example, implant and the pill. Um, but then you can see that uh, 75.7 percent of the women who stopped using injections actually just switched to not using contraception overall. So then if we want to see kind of what the reasons are that are playing into women quitting specifically injections, we can look at discontinuation reasons. So this shows you from um, the method that you want to look at to the reasons that the woman quit. So we can scroll over to injections here. Um, and you can see that out of the 3,000 women who um, discontinued or switched from injections, that kind of the main reason besides this voluntary reason of wanting to become pregnant um, is side effects. So that purple color ca is categorized by um, the DHS report as a method-related um, reason for discontinuation. So that's kind of what you can see at a, at a glance uh, through this application. And then if anyone has questions about this, we can answer them now or at the end. Yeah, and you're also welcome to come up and play with these at the end, too. Okay, <laughs> okay. so can we, can we, are we ready to go on to the next? Yes. All right. I'm going to drag this over. Oh. oh, so the next one is just to be humble that, right, there are technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> just some snapshots of errors that we've gotten and when we've been trying to develop this. And uh, we're, yeah, the aborted one is pretty, pretty sad. Um, so then I wanted to transition into what we've told you so far is what we did during Data Plus. Um, but then when BAS began, we had nine more students, right? We have nine more students and we have them divided into separate work teams. So we have those who are continuing to code the tool, so bug fixes and new features. And then we have a group of students who are doing stakeholder engagement and web content and design, because we eventually want to embed all of the apps we've created into a website. And then we have another group, as I've said, working on analysis and coding. Um, and so I want to bring up Molly Paley, who is on our stakeholder engagement team to talk about what we're doing in that regard. Hi, I'm Molly. Um, I'm part of the stakeholder engagement team and our efforts are sort of twofold. One is that we're looking to um, refine our understanding of how relevant stakeholders could use our tool and that involves um, going to the international conference on family planning next week where um, myself, Samia, Amy and Kelly will be presenting um, the work that they did over the summer, um, sort of asking for other researchers and advocates who are attending the conference, um, what they think of our tool, could they use it in their research, um, how can we update it to better reflect their needs. Um, and we'll be continuing these sort of stakeholder engagement meetings throughout the year. Um, we're planning a presentation at the Demographic and Health Surveys office in Washington, D.C. in the spring, um, and we're looking to also host user <coughs> feedback sessions where um, users engage with the tool online so that we can see where are errors in the tool, how do people um, use it, how can we make it more user-friendly. Um, and then we're looking to refine the user stories that were part of the system's requirement so we can really better understand um, what do relevant stakeholders want from a data visualization tool like the one created this summer. And then our other efforts are about refining the web content um, and sort of making that also accessible to researchers and advocates um, to include infographics about how to use the tool, um, defining why we chose discontinuation and the demographic and health surveys and how we um, differentiate between switching and discontinuation. So those are our stakeholder engagement efforts. Sure, yes. Uh, I just had a question about I guess stakeholders, um, when it comes to 
project this big, do you all ever consider kind of open sourcing it too to other developers who would be interested in creating similar applications or using similar data, or is that kind of muddy? Yeah, so we can't share the data, it's not ours, but we can share the code. So one of our eventual goals is to have our repositories, our code repositories public. So right now we have everything kind of in the cloud, but we only have access to it. So when we're ready to release it, I think we can release uh, a version that would let you do this with DHS data. But we did not develop core diagrams ourselves. We're using someone else's package for that, right? So Why are they called core diagrams? Because of the chords. <laughs> chords. <laughs> chords. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you have a Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a junior computer science and global health major, um, working with everybody here on the BAS project. So um, we're focusing, um, especially at the end of the semester and then going into next semester, on using machine learning to pull uh, deeper insights from the data that we're working with. Um, so uh, like the stakeholder engagement group, our piece is twofold as well. Um, the part that we're focusing right now on is doing a scoping review, so just trying to understand how machine learning has been used with global health data in the past and what techniques would be best suited for population-weighted data, um, and trying to understand where, um, how we can best shape our work to fit the need that the stakeholder engagement group is, is discovering. So we're working on that. We just started that last week. It's been super exciting. We're working with um, a really fantastic librarian to pull articles that um, we think will be helpful for us. Um, and then the other piece is using machine learning to understand um, what sort of clusters exist within this data, how we can determine which factors are um, most significant in predicting whether or not a woman will discontinue from the method that she's on and what that timeline might look like for her and for other women who um, have similar demographic factors, things like that. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so open the floor up for questions. Um, happy to talk more. Um, yeah, we have we have a graphic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is a common more than a question, but I've been involved with a couple of efforts over the years to do something kind of similar uh, with disparate data from around the world, and with the one caveat that uh, we were starting with data that wasn't necessarily collected with the same data architecture and variable names. <laughs> the way you largely are here, mm -hmm. what your team has done in one summer compares very favorably with what Oxford University and partners around the world accomplished in five years of $20 million from the Gates Foundation. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Over 1% of the cost? <laughs> but I'll still take the money. <laughs> Other questions? What's up? Did you have to get permission from DHS to to use and present the data, and eventually you make it access publicly accessible in that way? No, because we're not giving anybody the data. Like you've seen yeah. those big uh, studies that have every country in the DHS, and they're showing you trends over time. And so when we registered to download the data, we gave them a paragraph on exactly what we're going to do, and they said, "Go ahead, have fun." And, um, and so if you get to the point where you're, and I don't, do you have a web, public website or uh, app at this point? Yes, <laughs> it's posted on the website, but we're not really giving people yeah. the link yet. So if you get to the point that sort of it's public, mm -hmm. do you have to get some type of review from the DHS process? So, because you're then saying these are the result, these are the DHS mm -hmm. findings and results. and. If there were a like mistake in the code that showed false data, you know, or findings, I don't know. I'm just wondering what kind of um, clearance it has to go through. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure, but we uh, are do have contacts at the DHS. So someone that I worked with um, as a consultant on one of those DHS reports also yeah. uses the calendar data. So we are meeting with her for a brown bag in the spring, and then also a technical meeting with Tom Pullum, who's the kind of head honcho at DHS. So I'm sure we'll learn yeah. about any of Great. those things and the clearances they want. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 
Would you work with some, something like WHO? Would we what? Would you would you consider working with some something like you know some institution like WHO? Because you know some of the data that we see here, um, I mean the type of data, data that we see are something that you will see on the WHO report. Yeah, so WHO but does JAWS it. is like online and you can actually manage and you know actually visualize. Yeah, so we're actually also meeting with Track 20 and Family Planning 2020 at the ICFP. So I think uh, long term goals, maybe getting acquired would be good, right? Like if they wanted to take this on as a way to visualize their own data and to do it in house and spend $20 million on it, like, and give people access to it, I think that would be terrific. Um, we do have an app that uses the WHO data too that we didn't show you. We made like a mini gap binder. So <laughs> we didn't show you. If they like what you're doing, they would support as well. Oh, yeah. You, you could fund it as well. That's true. Yeah, we can also do it. Experts that they come to. Oh, yeah, we can be their consultants. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You hear that, YouTube? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so thank you. Um, other questions? So have you considered um, having sub-national analysis within the countries, which might be relevant for non-federal policymakers? Uh, well, the closest we can get in DHS is urban and rural areas of each province. So recent DHS um, surveys have increasingly gone sub-national regions, zones, states. So if they're population representative, they, they are. definitely do it. Yeah. In, the, in the past, I think five years, they've begun to do that for many countries. So is that yeah. something that you might want to consider? Sure. Um, since many of those decisions are made mm -hmm. subnationally. Yeah. If it's population representative, then we can just add another checkbox okay. in the data, another drop down menu. It would be really easy to do that. Yeah. I didn't know they were doing that. Lynn? Is the timeline you have for the data you have now, what year? Uh, 2009 to 2014. Okay. Yeah. I was asking because if it's like real time and if they change something on the DHS website, like how would you track? So the DHS release, releases versions of the data. And so we have the most recent versions DHS has released. And then if they were to update the publicly available version, then they email everyone who's downloaded it. So we would know there was a new version, and then we would have to update our system. That sounds like it's it.